Okie dokie. We have been, the last few weeks, in the book of Acts. It's been super fun. I really enjoyed it. For those of you who are new, I'm looking at you two. No, don't be belligerent. I'm just kidding. It's, I have class rules that I have to go over whenever someone like foreign comes in. Yeah, that's good for me. I need to hear right, uh, if, if you really want to fight me, please wait until after the class. Feel free to disagree. Just do it in love, please. So far, we haven't had any like confrontations, which is great. Because I told everybody that the Trinity doesn't exist, and they all believe me. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, that was a test. The emergency broadcast system. You passed. OK, so I don't need to go over any rules. This is cool. We've been in the Book of Acts. Um, aside from you two, has anybody not been in here for any of Acts? Has everybody else had at least one week of it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I'll do a quick, quick recap. It's getting increasingly difficult to do quick recaps the further we get into Acts, which is, it just makes sense. But uh, real quick, let's do this. Acts 1 through 6. By the way, uh, the reason we're doing this, well, there are other reasons, but basically uh, the, the point of this thing is to go in depth into Acts. It's to break it up into chunks and then say, okay, here's what happened. It's, it's tracing God's work through history in this time period. Because really what you're looking at in Acts is the beginning of the church. The book starts where the gospel's left off. Jesus leaves, he says, okay, you know what? It's up to you guys now. And the apostles wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, whatever that is, and the Holy Spirit lands during Pentecost and you have a launch of the church where you go from 120 or so believers to over 3,000 in one afternoon, which is this incredible explosion of the church. And what you see in the first, first six chapters is what you call the witness in Jerusalem. By the way, when I say first six chapters, and this is what that is, this is my opinion. I've just gone through and charted out the books to take it in manageable chunks. But these first six chapters are all going to be focused on the church in Jerusalem and the church growing within Jerusalem. And really, it grows fast. You have these, uh, Luke, who's the author of Acts, he makes it a point to mention multiple times how quickly the church was growing, you say, and many more were added to the number. And the number at this point was over 5,000 just men and all this stuff. And really, you see this uh, an incredible growth of the church within Jerusalem. And over here, this is 100% to Jews at this point. There were no non-Jews uh, receiving the gospel in this, uh, in this chunk here. The second major section within Acts is 6 through 12. It works out nicely because it's just 6 and 6. It gets more complicated after this, a lot more. But the first two sections are just chunks of 12, and this you can call the witness beyond Jerusalem. And starting at, I'm sorry, not 6 through 12, dummy, 7 through 12. This is just really, it's watching how the gospel at the end of chapter 6 begins to spread outside of Jerusalem to the rest of the world. Starting with the Greek-speaking or the Hellenistic Jews, you have a guy named Philip and a guy named Stephen who are appointed to, uh, appointed along with four other guys to head up the, uh, the uh, outreach to the Jews that spoke Greek because you had Aramaic and you had this language gap the apostles couldn't really deal with. And right there in chapter 7, you have this really rough chapter where Stephen goes out and he's, you know, he's bringing the gospel to these uh, Greek-speaking synagogues and he steps on some toes pretty quick. And he's brought before the Sanhedrin. This is the uh, kind of the Jewish Supreme Court, essentially. And to make a long story short, they stone him. And you have the first martyr in the history of Christianity, is Stephen. Uh, a guy was standing there who witnessed all these events, a member of the Sanhedrin named Saul. And we're going to see in chapter 9, kind of his story unfold no more. But again, chapter 7, you have Stephen, the first martyr, and that kind of launched a persecution, the first major persecution of uh, the history of Christianity, led by this guy named Saul. Chapter 8 is all about a guy named Philip, who's kind of Stephen's counterpart. He brings the gospel to a place called Samaria. You have the Samaritans, much hated by the Jews, they receive the gospel, they receive the Holy Spirit, things are going really well. You have some more stuff with Philip. I'm going to try to rush through this. 
Chapter 9 is all about Saul, and you have his conversion. On the road to Damascus, he witnesses this shining light. He's blinded, and uh, long story short, he comes to Christ. He comes to the gospel. He is converted. He's changed. And he becomes kind of one of the champions of the gospel from this point on. Um, chapters 10 and 11 tell how the gospel really got going to the Gentiles. You have Peter, who's ministering in different areas, and the guy named Cornelius. This is what we talked about last week. So this is just last week's stuff. Last week we went through um, halfway through chapter 9, all the way to the end of chapter 12. And you have uh, essentially the, the great wall between the Jews and the Gentiles being broken down at this point. It is really cool. I'm going to set my alarm for a break before I forget. There, set. It's really cool. The gospel comes to this guy named Cornelius. They receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter reports back. and you know, All the Jews are amazed. Wait, they can receive the gospel too because the Jews have this idea that the Gentiles are second class citizens. And um, In the end, the believers in Jerusalem accept this. They say, all right, well, God wants to bring the gospel to these guys too. God wants to bring this life to the Gentiles as well. So be it. Um, and finally in chapter 12... You have another, uh, an account of another persecution happening with Herod Agrippa II, who's the grandson of Herod the Great, the guy that tried to kill baby Jesus. And long story short, James, son of Zebedee, brother of John, apostle of Christ, is martyred. And uh, Herod tries to martyr Peter as well, but God rescues him out of prison. And in the end... Herod is killed, struck down by God, it says. And the moral of the story is nothing is going to stop the spread of the kingdom of God. Not the removal of the leader of the church and Peter, not the martyrdom of James, not the opposition of a king. The kingdom of God is going to continue blazing on. And that catches us up. So again, 1 through 6 covered the church's spread within Jerusalem. 7 through 12 covered various instances of its spread outside of Jerusalem, culminating in the gospel going to the Gentiles. This is a really big deal because, well, this is against the tides of history, essentially. Everything changes right there. It's really, really cool because we're Gentiles. I mean, I am. Maybe you're a Jew and <laughs> I never knew. I'm a poet and I didn't know it. Uh, but probably we're all Gentiles. Most people you know are Gentiles and we have the gospel starting there in Acts chapter 10. If you want to find the real beginning there, that's when things launch into it. And it's not going to stop. It's going to roll faster and faster. And especially we're going to see it right here. Because picking up in chapter 13, we have our next section. Notice how it's significantly shorter than these previous two. We have what's called, and it's up there, but I'll just write it so we remember. The first missionary journey of Acts. First missionary journey ever, sort of. We call it the first missionary journey because there's three within the book of Acts, all led by a guy named Saul. And again, he's converted to this point. He's a champion of the gospel, and uh, this is going to be his kind of big debut as a missionary. Uh, this takes place over a period of about a year to a year and a half. So... You can read through these two chapters, and it's, it's pretty easy to think like weeks or a month. But this is a long time. I mean, we, a lot of us are familiar with YWAM. My name. Sorry. No problem. A lot of us are familiar with YWAM. We go, okay, outreach equals a month. You know, that's a, that's a longer outreach than a lot of people think. Maybe two months. That's a, three months. Wow, that's a serious outreach. This was an outreach. Uh, this is a large period of time. And... The second and third missionary journeys were even longer. And we'll, uh, we'll get to those in, in some coming weeks. But this is going to take place between A.D. 46 and A.D. 47. So you're looking at in between, well, roughly, to say, rounded off at like 15 years or so after the death of Christ. And, uh, I mean, that's a significant period of time. So this just gives you an idea here we are getting close to, by the end of this, we'll be halfway through the book of Acts. So halfway through, roughly 15 years have passed. Um, and uh, this is going to be a short term, well, 
relatively short term compared to the second and third, but a very powerful outreach. It's going to set the framework for some worldwide ministry that Paul's going to launch into. So here's how we start. Uh, this is up in, and I'll give you a map real quick. Let's zoom in. This is up in Antioch. So way down here, we have Jerusalem. Way up here, we have Antioch, Syrian Antioch, because there's another Antioch we'll talk about later. But uh, what happens here, let's go back. What happens here is you have the, the church leaders at Antioch. Um, up to this point within Christianity, Jerusalem acted as kind of the base. This is where all the leaders were. This is all the apostles were located. And it was, if there were any major decisions going to happen, Jerusalem is the place it's going to happen. Starting around this point in history, Antioch, Antioch sort of starts replacing Jerusalem as the, blade, as the base. Not completely, as we're going to see in chapter 15, which we'll hopefully get to tonight. But Antioch starts kind of pioneering some things. And so what happens is you have the leaders at Antioch, and it, it, Luke records that they were directed by the Holy Spirit to send Barnabas, who we first learned about in uh, Acts chapter 5, um, and who has since become not a leader of the church, but kind of a right-hand man of leader of the church. Uh, Barnabas and Saul on a, a wider mission. Barnabas, at this point, has taken Saul under his wing. Um, those of you who were, last week, uh, who were here last week, we talked about this in more depth, but Barnabas is kind of mentoring Saul, standing up for him, because obviously, for a while, the Christians were kind of scared of him. <laughs> he was their prime persecutor, after all. But he's taken Saul under his wing, and the leaders feel like, okay, you know what? Let's, let's take Barnabas and Saul, these two guys, and let's send them out. Not just like, let the spread of the gospel naturally happen, but let's actually send these guys to do it. Let's take the initiative here. Um, the Holy Spirit feels like it's, it's time, to, uh, time to roll on this thing. And what's really clear within Luke's account of this is that the Holy Spirit is responsible for this. In other words, God has said, let's, let's roll. Let's do this. I'm not going to sit back and wait for this to happen. Let's, let's do it. Um, and again, let's bring it back to the map. But this is a map of the first missionary journey. It's going to start in Antioch and you can watch the original line down to Cyprus up to... Lycia and into Galatia. Um, but uh, it also makes a point to mention that a guy named John Mark is with them at this point. Anybody know off the top of your head who John Mark is? John Mark, the writer of the gospel. John Mark, the author of Mark. He was also related to Barnabas. Did you know he was Barnabas' cousin? That was the main reason that Barnabas brought him along. John Mark, again, uh, this is a guy who was not with Jesus. Uh, he was not one of Jesus' original disciples, uh, yet he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Um, this is namely due to a lot of interviews that he would take, a lot, mostly from Peter, we can surmise. But John Mark is with them, and he's actually going to cause some issues. And we'll, we'll see that in a moment. But the first place they go, and actually I should just go back to the map real quick. First place they go is Cyprus. Canaan, to catch you up. They have just started their first missionary journey. The leaders in Antioch have sent Barnabas and uh, Saul on a missionary journey. The first of three within the book of Acts. They go from Antioch to Cyprus. Um, the exact reason they chose Cyprus, we don't really know. But Cyprus was Barnabas' hometown. So it's probably a good guess if Barnabas is like, well, I'm familiar with the place. Let's, let's go there. And immediately what they do when they arrive to Cyprus is they go to the synagogues. They go to the synagogues and proclaim the word of God, proclaim the message of Christ to the Jews. And uh, this was their strategy throughout the whole island. And really, if you read the book of Acts, you'll find that Saul or Paul or whatever you choose to call him, this is kind of his, his strategy. He gets to an area, and if there's a synagogue, he goes to that first. Any, any guesses why he would do that? Well, they were the, the, the people who knew the law, and they were, Jesus was the fulfillment of it, the jot and tittle of that law. Yeah, what's, what's convenient about going to the Jews is they have a foundation already. 
you're not working from scratch like you were with the Gentiles, because it really was working from scratch. You've got to build up a foundation of, okay, here's the truth, and here's why it's valuable. Here's why you want to come to this guy named Christ. For the Jews, they already come from a standpoint of believing that there's a Messiah coming. So all you have to do is prove that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and bam, you've got a Christian. That's how it would work in theory. Now, you ended up having some complications a lot, as we're going to see. But this is what Saul slash Paul does. He goes to a synagogue first, and he proclaims the word of the Jews. It's a natural starting point. They have the scriptures already. They put this huge emphasis on it. Technically, they're supposed to be devoted to God in the first place. So like a new thing that God's doing should be nothing but excitement. Often it was, but even more often it wasn't, for whatever reason. So what also is going to happen here in Cyprus is they're going to come across uh, what Luke describes as a magician, a false Jewish prophet named Bar-Jesus. Don't read into the name. Jesus was a very common name uh, within Jewish communities at this time. It was, it was very common. There's lots of Jesus I, Jesuses. They came across this guy, and whatever... Uh, Whatever it entails to be a magician slash false prophet named Bar-Jesus is not explained to us. He spoke for God and did tricks or miracles. Whatever it was, he just was, had, some, had some renown in the area. And this false prophet, it says, was in the company of a proconsul. Um, who This proconsul desired to hear the message that Saul and Barnabas were speaking. Um, anyone have any idea what a proconsul is? So I, yeah, it was sort of, sort of like a governor. Uh, Cyprus and really anywhere they're going to go on this, uh, anywhere they're going to go on these uh, mission trips, is a Roman province. Most of the known world was a Roman province around this time, which is why it was so easy to go from place to place. Rome had conquered so much of the world that the language was unified in Greek, so you didn't have to worry about language gaps. Every city it was, it was unified. This is why it was so opportune for the gospel to spread now the fulfillment of, uh, of time. But uh, they, the proconsul was the highest ranking official, highest ranking Roman official within a Roman province. So this is a guy of very great influence. This is a good opportunity. And so apparently this uh, Bar Jesus fellow was, had been hanging around the proconsul. Apparently he was enjoying some position of power, some position of influence over this proconsul. And this guy wants to hear what Saul and Barnabas have to say, and it says here that Bar Jesus was uh, probably fearing for his own kind of position. Like maybe if they if they like this new message, they're not gonna or he's not gonna want me around as much. And so he opposes them because he's viewing the missionaries as a threat to the power that he's gained here. And he, he opposes them. And Saul and really God is very very displeased with the way Bar-Jesus acts, you have this, uh, this response here kind of shows us how angry God is towards this kind of, uh, this kind of attitude. Because it was a selfish, self-serving thing. He says here, it's a Saul who was also called Paul. This is the first time that's mentioned, by the way. And I'll go more into that in a moment. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked, path, crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of God is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And he was blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Notice this is a very heavy-handed response. And you'll see this throughout biblical history. When there's a very sensitive time, in other words, when things really need to go right, when, when God is determined to see his plan through, there's a heavy hand in this. God's, uh, this is kind of, to me, God's saying, I'm not going to let you stand in the way of what I'm doing. Don't you dare stand in the way of what I'm doing. You see this in early Israel. God had a, there was a very heavy-handed way God dealt with them because he needed to see his plans through. But uh, really, you have here like a clash of two kingdoms. Bar-Jesus is standing in the way of the gospel here for solely selfish reasons. Standing in the way of the kingdom of God, this is just an unacceptable thing. And so he immediately becomes blind for a time. It, it does give the temporal mention there because I think God wanted to see Bar Jesus come to him. But uh, it does make the mention, or uh, Luke does mention here that the proconsul believed. 
because, quote, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. There's a cool way to put it. You see this a lot. It's even with a lot of Gentiles, they're blown away by what's being presented by Saul and Barnabas. So uh, two things happen after this, and both of them I find pretty interesting. Two very interesting things. From here on out for the rest of the Bible, Saul is referred to as Paul. Um, some people will tell you that there's like a, like a deeper significance there. It, it represents his transformation from you know, a, a Jew of the law to a, a real Christian. And that's the, the transformation word. Uh, <clears throat> this is almost definitely due to the fact that from here on out, they're going to be in Gentile territory. Saul is a Hebrew name. King Saul. <laughs> it is a Hebrew name. It's a good Hebrew name. Paul is a Hellenistic name, a Greek name. He just wanted to be as a approachable as he could be. He wanted to tear down any wall that would possibly stand between him and spreading the gospel to these people. And so this is what you see. Um, I think maybe a couple times in chapter 22 and chapter 26, he's referred to as Saul. But really from here on out, he's, he's Paul. And that's how we know him. You know? Who, who in Christian circles calls him Saul? Mm-hmm. We're Gentiles. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens here, and you notice it was Saul, or Paul, let's call him Paul from here on out. It was Paul who delivered this rebuttal, this rebuke. Uh, from here on out, uh, the group seems to, uh, Luke seems to treat the group uh, as being led by Paul. point Because before it was called uh, Barnabas and Paul and their companions went from place to place. From here on out, it's Paul and his companions. Read into that what you will, but uh, it seems to me, especially from the way the rest of Acts is treated, like Paul takes a position of leadership from here on out, from this moment. Because before you have Barnabas kind of over him, mentoring him under Barnabas' wing. And Paul kind of, kind of rises to the occasion. You see that over and over again, which is really cool. So again, they go from Antioch to Cyprus, and they really go, they go to the two main cities in the island, all throughout the, uh, the island of Cyprus at this point. And from here, they sail to Lycia. Lycia is modern-day Turkey, the southern coast of modern-day Turkey. Uh, they land in the port city of Italia, and they go to a place called Perga. Now here, right here in Italia, no, pardon me, in Perga, John Mark, you see this little dot down here? John Mark leaves them, it says, and goes to Jerusalem. It's kind of a quick mention, but this is going to become an issue later. Uh, an issue starting in chapter 16 with the second missionary journey. So just keep that in your mind. If you're not here when we go over chapter 16, whatever. They're going to head to Perga, and then they're going to head to Antioch. And you're like, wait a minute. They started from Antioch. Well, the confusing part is there's two Antiochs. And Luke often just says Antioch, whether he's referring to Syrian Antioch or Pisidian Antioch, which is what this one is known as. This is Pisidian Antioch, much smaller. The other Antioch is like the third largest city in the empire, the Roman Empire at this point. This is a much smaller place. So <laughs> I remember the first time I read that when I was sitting in I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. And I'm trying to like map it out. They went back to the, the Antioch. And, and the, anyway, it's a different Antioch. They'll get tripped up. Uh, and again, if I say Pisidian Antioch, know that it's the one in Galatia. If I say Syrian, Ant- Syrian Antioch, know that it's the big one. If I mention it again, I'll probably just say that again. So you don't have to remember. What's important to note here, uh, how many of you are familiar with the book of Galatians? There's actually uh, some very interesting debate as to where that book was written to, what area it was written to. <sighs> My opinion is that it was written to this area. This is this area of Galatia right here. Uh, Galatians is almost definitely the first epistle that Paul wrote. Probably it was written within a year to a year and a half of what happened here. And it was almost definitely written to these churches in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And so keep in mind here, and this is why I've talked about Acts being really, really neat as far as a hermeneutical tool. 
Because so often you can read it and you can see how the churches were started and the things they struggled with. And then you can read the letters that were written to those areas and go, wow, okay, I get it. He was writing to address a lot of this stuff. So keep in mind, it is extremely likely, in my opinion, that the events that take place in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby that we're about to cover give us the context for the letter to the churches in Galatia. Interesting tidbit. Next. So here they're in Pisidian Antioch. And once again, we're in chapter 13, by the way. Once again, they go to the synagogues first. They immediately go to the synagogues in, uh, in Pisidian Antioch to preach. And here you have a very long account where you have a sermon. Often you read Acts and it's just like it's telling you what happened. And then you'll have a sermon, which is just like this, this discourse where Paul or whoever else is trying to prove to Jews or Gentiles or whoever, trying to prove to them the truth of the gospel, the value of the gospel. And so Paul gives a sermon. That's what this whole, almost the, the rest of chapter 13 is going to be about this sermon. And there's actually a lot of parallels between what Paul does here in his sermon and what Stephen did in chapter 7. For those of you who have read this, it's very similar with some very, very important key differences. Uh, remember that he's speaking to Jews here. This is a synagogue. He's speaking to Jews. And what this sermon consists of, it's, a, it's a, an Old Testament history, starting with the Exodus and ending with King Saul, with a focus on God's provision for his people. This is what he focuses on the whole time, God's provision. How God, whenever his people needed something, he provided them with the way to salvation, to use the term loosely, with the way out or the way to whatever is good or however you want to think of it. God provided for his people over and over and over again throughout history. Well, that's what Paul does here, is remind the Jews of how God has provided for them over and over again, how the Jews graciously accepted his provision because they'd be stupid not to. And so what he does with this is he says, look at all this provision that God has done. God's ultimate provision for us is found in Jesus Christ. It's a very clever thing that Paul does. So look at all the ways God has provided for us. And the ultimate provision is in this man, Jesus Christ, is in this Messiah. His ultimate provision to fix our situation, to fulfill the law, to usher us into life as it was meant to be, is found in this guy, Jesus. And finally, and this is point one, a sketch of history with focus on provision. Point two, God's ultimate provision is in Jesus Christ. And finally, he gives an invitation to accept this provision. He says, brothers, we would be foolish to not accept this incredible provision God has offered us, just as our ancestors would have been foolish to not accept the provision that God offered them as well. It's a really neat thing. And as I mentioned here, it is very, very reminiscent of Stephen's sermon. Because what you see in chapter 7 is Stephen gives an Old Testament history. The difference here, the major, major difference is that Stephen pointed over and over again to Israel's rejection of God, how they constantly turn to apostasy. Over and over and over again, he says, just like our forefathers turned from God over and over again, you are turning from God by rejecting Jesus Christ. Whereas, again, Paul is focusing on God's provision, saying, how foolish would it be to not, to not accept this provision? It's a big difference. Now, um, I, I mentioned this when we talked about Stephen's sermon some weeks ago. It, it'd be tempt, uh, it's tempting to say Stephen goofed up because he got himself killed. Stephen should not have been so harsh in dealing with the, the Sanhedrin of all places. Maybe he should have been a little more tactful. However, it does make the mention in chapter 7 that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit when he said those things. And yes, it did kick a persecution into gear. But ultimately, at Paul, or Paul later talks about how uh, witnessing what he did, Stephen, <clears throat> influenced him to some degree. And even the persecution, it says, the, Jew, or the, the believers were scattered all over the place, but they continued to witness at all of the places they were scattered. Um, I, whether that was God's intent from the beginning or whether he worked with what he was given, um, however you want to put it, I, I believe that Stephen said what he did by the leading of the Holy Spirit. So you say, well, that was, that was dumb, Stephen. I, I think that God had a bigger plan in mind. Yes? Um, one thing I know here in 
that also is different from Stephen is that, and it's almost like a dig, and and it's very consistent with the veil being put over the Jews' eyes. As you know, they when I speak to most Jewish people, there's the Torah, there's the Pentateuch. That's it. They don't read the prophets, but especially they don't, do not read the minor prophets. I mean, they don't know anything about Habakkuk, the Amos, none of it. And he says, and even quotes Habakkuk here, yeah. where he says, Beware therefore lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets, and behold ye despisers and wonder and perish for a work of work in your days of work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man deliver it right unto you. Right? And it's almost like a, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, it's read to you every Saturday or Sabbath, um, and and uh, yet they never really pay any great. They still don't. They, it is my experience, and and um, and I'm not saying that. It, it, well, I do say that critically. I think you ought to read your own Bible. I mean, you know, at least if that's the part you claim is the real part, yeah. read it. You know. And um, um, and he's throwing it right at them. He quotes three of the Psalms in there, or at least two of them, you know. Quote yep. Psalm 2 and mm -hmm. Psalm 16, and then the, then that, then Habakkuk he quotes, and it's read to you every Saturday. And this is a fulfillment of it. And, yep. and yet, they don't buy it. Yeah, and you'll see, even though there's, there's a distinctly less harsh tone with Paul's message here, but you see... Paul getting increasingly uh, fed up in a lot of cases. You'll, you'll see it really, well, in a moment here, you'll see him kind of lose his cool a little bit. He, he doesn't seem to have a, a terrible amount of patience for the way the Jews treat the gospel in many cases. But again, you have this, this sermon he preaches, and it goes over really well, shockingly. Like we've kind of been uh, conditioned at this point to expect Jewish opposition, but it goes over really well. And those who heard him speak, those who heard him and Barnabas uh, speaking, they, it says here in verse 42, they begged that these things might be told to them again on the next Sabbath, which is great. This is really good. You have a, a one foot in the door. Yeah, Timmy. Here's something that has been coming while I'm going through this. I... You know, the Jews were the ones who were supposed to be the light to the world. And it's, it's as if God just keeps pursuing them and giving them that opportunity no matter how many times. You know, he gives, he gave Stephen, now he's Paul, just keeps saying, come on, come on, do what, you know, I gave you. It was just, I don't know, it's for the, studying it now, it's like the first time I'm seeing that. It's kind yeah. of cool. Yeah, um, Paul almost echoes exactly what you were saying in just a second. But you have this very favorable response. This is great. The Jews are responding well. <laughs> However, the next Sabbath, it says... Hey, come on in. You're good. Uh, we're going to take a break in a second, and I'll catch you up.